Shalom Nikulam. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Gross. I'm a senior fellow here at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center in Jerusalem. Uh, and you're joining me for a, a special event that we're doing uh, to reflect on uh, the Tisha B'Av, which for us here in Israel has just concluded. Uh, for those of you um, watching us, joining us uh, from Europe and North America, it's still going on. Um, but um, I am welcoming here uh, a large number of people from around the world. Many are regulars to my, uh, to my weekly events on Zoom. Some of you, I think, are new. Um, I will just say before I introduce our speaker that uh, every Wednesday, usually on a Wednesday at 8.30 Israeli time, uh, I speak to or host uh, an Israeli based um, political figure or journalist or academic, uh, and we discuss an issue pertinent to Israeli politics or history, uh, current affairs, Zionism, all the issues that we deal with here at the Begin Heritage Center. And we've been doing this for just over a year, uh, and we regularly get um, a, a, a great crowd to, uh, to listen to our speakers and to ask them questions. Today is a little bit different. We're doing it on a Sunday, and we're doing it on a Sunday specifically because uh, today was, is uh, Tisha B'Av. Um, I wish uh, those of you in Israel who fasted, I hope you had a, a, an easy fast. For those of you fasting, still fasting uh, in other parts of the world, I hope it's going okay. Um, now, um, this is going to be uh, based on Tisha B'Av. It's going to be, uh, there's going to be some, some texts, some Yadut, some Judaism. Um, but because this is the Begin Center, and we've been doing these things now for for a year or so, we're also going to be bringing things up to date and talking about um, some contemporary issues as well. Uh, and because I wanted to combine those two things um, of a, a deep uh, learning uh, in, in Judaism and Jewish thought, Jewish philosophy, text, um, and a thorough understanding of Israeli current affairs and politics, uh, that's really the reason that I invited um, my guest uh, today, Kaleb Bendor. Um, he is uh, a deputy editor of the Fathom Journal, um, which is a British, British uh, journal focused on the Middle East. Uh, he has spent over a decade in foreign policy circles, both inside and outside government. He's taught and lectured on Jewish and Zionist thought to a variety of audiences, including in London, Melbourne, Cape Town, Hong Kong and Jerusalem. And his articles have appeared in several media outlets. On a personal note, he's also a good friend and someone I've spent a lot of time uh, learning from over many years. So Kalev, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Paul. Great to be here. Um, so Kalev is going to uh, speak and, and present mm -hmm. um, uh, for, the, for the majority of this session. Um, I'm gonna, if you have uh, questions, you can write them in the chat, the chat facility at the bottom of your screen. Um, I don't want to interrupt Kalev too much. Um, but if there are, um, if it's particularly pertinent or something that really needs to be, that I, I think really needs to be explained more based on your question, then I will put it to Kalev. Otherwise, we'll have a little bit of time, I think, at the end uh, for a short, for a short discussion based on, based on Kalev's presentation. So, uh, Kalev, take it away. Great, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, it's really good to uh, see so many people joining. I'm very aware that we have people in different time zones. So we have people who um, have, have just finished their fast. We have probably people in Europe who are uh, certainly in Northern Europe who've still got a very long time uh, to go. And then we've got people in the US who are kind of halfway through. So um, <clears throat> I hope everyone, whatever stage you're in, um, is having a, a meaningful time. What I would like to do today is, and, and it kind of brings together two of my, two of my big interests is to merge together a traditional text and contemporary Jewish uh, poli Israeli politics, Zionist thought, and um, we're going we're gonna to focus that on, on, on Tisha B'Av. So what we're going to start with is, is probably the place where very few deep ideological debates take place. Um, which is Twitter. And Twitter um, hosted a very, very interesting discussion between 
two two sets of two sets of conversations in the last couple of weeks, and it was over uh, what's called the the citizenship law. The citizenship law um, was a, a law that basically banned Israelis who married people from uh, certain countries, the West Bank, Gaza, Syria, Iraq, um, from automatically getting residency in Israel. It was relatively controversial. Generally, the right wing supported it, and those more on the left wing were, were more uncomfortable with it. And every year, for over a decade, the Knesset has automatically extended it for another year. What happened this year, um, as many of you know, there is, a, there, there, there is a split between the government and the opposition. But within the opposition, you have a lot of right wing parties who, in theory, would be supportive of extending this law, but had a dilemma because they also want to bring down the government. Um, and the big question would be, how are these right wing parties going to vote? Um, and in the lead up to that, a tweet takes place from someone called Matan Kahana, who's from the Yamina party, so he's part of Bennett's party, um, which relates to Tisha B'Av, which we'll read in a moment. And the response to it is from someone called Simcha Rotman, who is from Basala Smotrich's party, uh, the so-called religious Zionist party, um, who are outside the government and very much want it to be toppled. So what we're going to do, just for a few minutes, I'd just like to read you, it's in Hebrew, I will translate it, read you these back and forth tweets. And the reason we're doing that is because they relate to Tisha B'Av and a very famous story from the Talmud, which we are subsequently going to learn. And what we will see is the different ways, the different lessons that this Talmudic story gives. Um, so I'm going to share my screen for one second. Okay, so I'm, I'm aware that I'm aware that some people uh, understand Hebrew, some people don't. I just want, want you to see it, just because I think it's interesting. So we're going to start with the bottom one. It's it's June twenty seventh. I think just gonna look on the calendar. I think that was Shiva Sabatamus, and this is a week before the vote, and there's a big debate going on. What are these right wing parties going to do? Are they going to vote with the government? and pass the law, which they support ideologically, or are they going to try and topple the government or certainly embarrass the government because they think the government is a disaster? So what is Matan Kahana, who is, who is an ally of Prime Minister Bennett? What does he say? The period of the three weeks reminds us how the destruction happened. Today, we once again remember how the Kari zealots brought exile upon us. Now we're going to read about these, these zealots in a few minutes. And then he says this, Netanyahu and Smotrich, don't burn the storehouses. We'll get to what that means in a few minutes. Don't burn the storehouses. You are the opposition to the government, not to the state. Do you really intend to vote against extending the citizenship law? That's what he tweets. And Simcha Rotman, who, spoiler alert, they do end up voting against the citizenship law, says this in a very sarcastic way that probably, I mean, discussing Twitter is, is a different lecture, but probably Twitter in some ways facilitates his snarky response. But he says this, historically, there's a few different versions to the story of the fall of Jerusalem. For some reason, Matan Kahana chose, chose to adopt the version of um, Josephus, the person who, um, sorry, a traitor to his faith and brothers in arms who, who moved sides to join the Romans and who praised Titus. Titus is the Roman general who destroyed the temple for his greatness and leadership. Some historical coincidence. Why does he say this? Because the whole 
Smotrich, religious Zionist and Likud, I'd say argument is Bennett and co are traitors. OK, so we've now got two tweets from two, again, right wing. If you ask them their views on the Palestinian question, there probably would not be a huge amount of difference. You've got two right wing, both religious MKs, both talking about a story in the Gemara. But uh, basically promote completely different versions. Um, so again, Josephus is a very, very famous Jew. He becomes kind of the historian for the Roman Empire. He was a, a Jewish general um, who, is, who is caught up in the siege at, at Yotfat in northern Israel. And, and in the end, after everyone else has, has kind of committed suicide, he, he surrenders to the Romans and, and he joins the Romans. Uh, so to Rotman and, and many others, he's a traitor. What does Kahana say? Simcha. I suggest you open Tractate Git in 56. As in, this has got nothing to do with Josephus. This is from the Gemara. And by the way, this is the Gemara we're about to learn. There it says there were three rich men who could have kept the city going for 21 years. The sages said to the, the, to the, to the zealots or to the thugs, let us go out and make peace with the Romans. The thugs resisted, refused and insisted on fighting. The sages said to them, you won't succeed. The thugs then went and burnt the storehouses, not Josephus, rather Rav, Rav Ashi and Ravina. As in, what I'm quoting from, it's not Josephus. It's basically the Gemara, the Gemara that both me and you as religious Jews see as authoritative. What does Rotman say? I'd be happy for you to show me where in that source it says that the burning of the granaries was the reason for the temple's destruction. In fact, in the same place, it says that the reason for the destruction, listen to this, again, listen to it in the background of what's going on in Israel at the moment and the arguments between kind of the Bennett right wing and the Likud Smotrich right wing. Why was the temple destroyed? Because of the boycott that some segments, boycott of some segments of the community in the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, and their collaboration with the enemy. And the people who saw this collaboration were prevented from taking strong steps against it. Okay, so in other words, a second. So in other words, we've now got these Tweets back and forth, back and forth. And again, I don't think that Twitter is, is, the, is, is the inspiration for deep ideological discussions. But we've got two right wing nationalist religious MKs, one of whom is part of a party that joined the government, one of whom is part of, is part of a party that is actively opposed to the government. They are both ultimately relating to the same story, which we're about to read. And they're both pointing their fingers to different lessons that it just so happens advance their own political positions. Weirdly enough, there were two other very right wing nationalist individuals who were also arguing about the citizenship law and who were also talking about the same story. And just very briefly, I'd like us to look at them as well. I think they're, they're less significant, but I think they're just as interesting. The first one is someone called Arnon Segal. Arnon Segal, he's a journalist. Um, he's an educator. He's also a major proponent um, of kind of the Temple Mount movement of, of Jews being able to go up onto the Temple Mount and of being able to pray there. And his tweet takes place immediately after the vote that takes place, which the government loses. As in this law, and I don't want to get into the law, it's controversial, but this law that amongst others, the Shin Bet was saying it was important to pass, we had a bunch of right-wing parties voting against it. Again, I'm not judging them, they, they had their own reasons for it. So what does Segal say? This must be how they felt in Jerusalem in 70 CE, moments before the storehouses were burnt and before the Romans came and destroyed everything. 
so happy with the downfall of their domestic opponents and so righteous in inverted commas. And he's, and in response to him, is an even more right wing. It's like we, we started right and then we kind of moved even further to the right. There's an even more right wing former MK with connections to uh, Kach and Mayor Kahana. And he says as follows, no storehouses would have saved Jerusalem. At Masada, they had enough food and water for a hundred years. No one burnt them. The city fell due to, amongst other things, a so-called right-wing officer in the Galilee who defected to the enemy. I assume he's talking about Josephus. And he wasn't the only one. Titus's chief of staff was a Jew. Listen to this. Then he was called Julius Tiberius. Today, he's called Shaked. Okay? Now, open brackets. Tiberius Julius Alexander was an, uh, was an Alexandrian Jew from Egypt. He joins the Romans uh, many, years before the, many years before the rebellion. And he become, he's, he, he's literally Titus's chief of staff. He's second in command. So what does Michal ben Ari say? The second in command was due. What, why does it, why does Jerusalem fall? Not because of the storehouses, but because of treachery because there are traitors in our midst. Who's a traitor in our midst today? Ayala Shaked, Naftali Bennett's second in command. Okay, so you've got this, this comparison between Titus's second in command, Titus who destroys the temple, and Bennett's second in command. Now, I mean, part of me wants to say like I'm not judging this and part of me wants to say that that is absolute is an absolutely wild thing to say um but now now i want us to learn the story so all of these four people are referring to the same story they're referring to a story that, that, that some of you may have learned before some of you may not have um and the gemara says the talmud says the temple was destroyed because of it's called the, the story of kamsa and bar kamsa we'll read it in a moment and as we're reading it, I want you to think about, and, and if you want, please um, kind of type in, in the text and Paul will read it out later. Who does the Gemara think? Or, or even from reading it, who do you feel is responsible and not responsible? Who's responsible and not responsible for the destruction of the temple? Um, so we're going we're gonna to read that now. I'll just add just a little bit of history. The temple gets destroyed in 70 CE by, by the Romans. Uh, Jews continue to live in Judea. Around six years later, in 132 CE, another rebellion takes place against the Romans. It is led by uh, someone called Bar Kochba. He is supported by Rabbi Akiva, who is a major sage. The siege lasts for the, the siege. The rebellion lasts for three years before it is. It's initially successful, but it is ultimately brutally put down. Over half a million Jews are are killed. Um, many more die of starvation. Many more are, are sold into slavery. And at that stage, the vast majority of the country is expelled. Um, I should just add that according to tradition, the five original things that we mourn for on Tisha B'Av before we get to the expulsion from Spain and the expulsion from England and, and all of that, before we get to that, there's five things. The two temples, uh, the story following, following the spies in the Torah, the, 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 the uh, B'nai Israel, the children of Israel cry over the spies report and God says, because of that, you will not enter the land. The fourth one relate, is about the fall of the city of Beitar. That relates to Bar Kokhba. So actually what we're going to be looking at today, which is the destruction of the Second Temple and the fall of Beitar, the, the, the end of the rebellion, both of those things are related to Tisha B'Av. And the fifth is Jerusalem being plowed uh, into a field. So we're now going to read. It, it's quite a long 
story. Bear with me. It's, it's, uh, I'll, sh I'll share the screen. Um, and this, I would argue, is probably the, the main story in the Gemara of why the destruction happens. And what we will see is it's basically just one kind of mistake after another, one poor decision after another, until ultimately the Romans are at the gates and the temple gets destroyed. So, um, hold on one second. Okay, so Rabbi Yochanan said, this is, this is an edited version. Rabbi Yochanan said, what is the meaning of the verse? Happy is the man who's anxious always, but he who hardens his heart falls into misfortune. It's a verse from, from Mishle, from Proverbs. And, and what we'll see is that this story we're about to learn is the illustration of this verse. It's also interesting to think who the verse might be referring to. The destruction of Jerusalem came through a Kamsa and a Bar Kamsa. A certain man had a friend Kamsa and an enemy Bar Kamsa. He made a party and said to his servant, go and bring Kamsa. The man went and brought Bar Kamsa. When the host found him there, he said, since you're my enemy, what are you doing here? Get out. Bar Kamsa said, since I'm here, let me stay. I will pay you for whatever I eat and drink. The host refused. Let me give you half the cost of the party. The host said no. Let me pay for the whole party. The host still refused, threw Bar Kamsa out. Bar Kamsa reasoned. Since the rabbis were sitting there and did not stop him, they clearly agreed with him. I will go and inform against them to the Roman government. He went and said to the emperor, the Jews are rebelling against you. How can I tell? The emperor asked. Bar Kamsa said, send them an offering and see whether they're offered up on the altar. So the emperor sent Bar Kamsa with a fine calf. And while on the way, Bar Kamsa made a blemish on the calf's upper lip, or some say on the white of its eye, in a place where Jews count it as a blemish, but the Romans do not. The rabbis were inclined to offer the sacrifice in order not to offend the government. But Rabbi Zachary ben Avkulus said, People will say that blemished animals are offered on the altar. So they proposed to kill Bar Kamsa, so you shouldn't go and inform against them. But Rabbi Zachari ben Avkula said, is one who makes a blemish on consecrated animals to be put to death? In brackets, so they, they don't do anything. They, they just don't offer it up and the Romans get annoyed. And the Romans now believe that they are rebelling. I should just add, this is not considered to be historically accurate, but that's not really important. What's important is how Jewish tradition viewed the destruction and through the mistakes that were made, how we can potentially, hopefully prevent any further destruction or tragedy. Rabbi Yochanan remarked through the Anvetanut, Anvetanut is a very difficult word to translate. I translated it as over humility of Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulus, our house was destroyed, our temple burnt, we ourselves exiled from our land. The Romans now attack. The emperor sent Vespasian, who came and besieged Jerusalem for three years. In Jerusalem were three men of great wealth. These men were in a position to keep the city for 21 years. The Biryonai, the thugs or the zealots, were then in the city. The rabbi said to them, let us go out and make peace with the Romans. They would not let them. But on the contrary, they said, let us go out and fight them. The rabbi said, you will not succeed. The zealots then rose up and burnt the stores of wheat and barley so that a famine ensued. Just one second, I've got to move the thing. Abba Sikra, the head of the Biryonim in Jerusalem was the, son, was the nephew the son of the sister of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, one of, one of the leading sages in Jerusalem. He sent to him saying, come to visit me privately. When he came, he said to him, how long are you going to carry on in this way and kill Caleb? all the people with Caleb, starvation? We're, sorry, Caleb, we're still, the, the screen is still showing the first text. Okay, hold on. Yeah, that's, that's better. Great, okay, thanks Paul.
So the, the, the head of the, the zealots is the nephew of one of the sages. They arrange a meeting. How long are you going to carry on in this way and kill all the people with starvation? Abba Sikra replied, what can I do? By the way, this is a very, very interesting comment about the dynamics of extremism. That even when the leader of the zealots is considering taking a slightly more moderate path, he doesn't feel like he can. So Abba Sikra replied, what can I do? If I say a word to them, they will kill me. Rabbi Yochan ben Zakai said, devise some plan for me to escape. Perhaps I shall be able to save a little. Abba Sikra said, pretend to be ill. Don't try this at home. Pretend to be ill. Let everyone come to inquire about you. Bring something evil smelling and put it by you so people will think that you're, that you're dead. Let, let then your disciples get under your bed, but no others. So they shall not notice that you're still light since they know that a living being is lighter than a corpse. He did so. And Rabbi Eliezer went under the, the buyer from one side, and Rabbi Joshua from the other. And when they reached the door, some men wanted to put a lance through it to check that he was actually dead. The sages said to them, shall the Romans say they have pierced their master? So they wanted to give it a push. He said, shall they say they pushed their master? So they opened a town gate for him and he got out. So again, the siege is, is ongoing. The people are starving. And one of the sages has managed to smuggle himself out in order to parley or, or negotiate with, with the Romans. When Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai reached the Romans, he said, peace to you, O king, peace to you, O king. Vespasian said, your life is forfeit on two counts. One, because I'm not a king, yet you call me one. And second, if I am a king, why didn't you come to me before now? He replied, as for you saying that you're not a king, in truth, you are a king, since if you were not, Jerusalem would not be handed into your hands. Now, while that is happening, news comes that Vespasian actually has become emperor of Rome. And so Vespasian is extremely impressed by this sage. And so he says to him, I'm leaving, but I'm going to send someone in my place. But you can make a request because you've impressed me. You make a request and I will grant it. Rabbi Yochanan said, give me Yavne and all of its sages and the chain of Rabban Gamliel, he, he, he's the patriarch, and physicians to heal Rabbi Tzadok, who's another sage. So he doesn't ask for Jerusalem. He asks for Yavne. Rabbi Yosef, or some say Rabbi Akiva, applied to him the verse, God turns wise men backwards and makes their knowledge foolish. Yochanan ben Zakkai should have said, let the Jews off this time. Why didn't he? He thought that so much would not be granted, in which case even a little would not be saved. As in, if he asks for Jerusalem and Vespasian says, no, that's too much. And now you've, you've, wasted, your, you've wasted your request. So that is an edited, it's a long story, but it's an edited version of the story. That is what each of those four right wing thinkers are referring to. As I said, 62 years later, another rebellion begins. And what's interesting is that Rabbi Akiva, who appears in our story, who criticizes Yochanan ben Zakkai for not asking for Jerusalem, appears in the next story as well. He is, according to Maimonides, he is the arms bearer He's of, 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 uh, of Bar Kokhba. He's certainly one of the major uh, supporters, ideological supporters of it. Now, Interestingly, the Gemara is more or less silent, more or less silent on the Bar Kokhba rebellion, probably because they're traumatized by it. So much, some of what we know comes from a, a Roman historian called uh, Dio Cassius. And, and in short, Dio Cassius says that it began very well for the Jews. The, um, the Roman generals couldn't say their, their um, traditional greeting of me and my, uh, me and my legions are well, um, but ultimately it leads to complete destruction of Judea. Um, the fall of Betar is kind of, is kind of one of the last steps. That's one of the things we mark on Tisha B'Av. I'll just read very, very briefly. Dio Cassius says, Hadrian sent against him his best generals. 
50 of their most important outposts and 985 of their most famous villages were razed to the ground. 580,000 men were slain in the various raids and battles. And the numbers of those that perished by famine, disease and fire was past finding out. Thus nearly the whole of Judea was made desolate, a result of which the people had had full warning before the war. I should add that there is, this is the third rebellion against Rome by the Jews in the space of 65 years. There's one in 70 CE, there's one, I think, in the diaspora in around 110 CE. And then there's this in 132 to 135. Many Romans, moreover, perished in this war. Therefore, Hadrian, in writing to the Senate, did not employ the opening phrase commonly offered, if you and your children are in health, it is well. I and the legions are in health. So we now have two stories. Two stories that we mark on Tisha B'Av. Um, I'm interested in here, Paul, I don't know if people have, uh, have made comments. If they have, who, who do people think are most responsible for what happened? Who's responsible and who's not responsible? Paul, do you have anything to, to share? Well, so we don't, so there aren't any comments yet. I'm going to ask people if they do have thoughts to write them in the chat. Um, in, our, in response to Caleb's question, who's responsible, who's not responsible from the from the story? Um, I mean, I, I just say that the as you said, the the Kamsa Bar Kamsa story is not is not a is not to be taken as a literal event that happened, but rather as something symbolic, right? So my understanding of it or my reading of it would be the the, the Bar Kamsa is the um, uh, Bar Kamsa is the uh, the sort of scorned the scorned Jew, the Jew the, the Jew who didn't find who who was treated badly by his fellow Jews, um, and there, and therefore sort of wanted wanted to bring the whole house down. And that was and that he represents he represents a wider feeling in society at the time. Right. Okay, so I'll, I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll say a couple more things, and then please, in the meantime, uh, people, leave, people leave comments. So, again, this is something that four different Twitter analysts, for, for want of a better word, all had something to say about. What are the, over, putting, aside, uh, putting aside the people, what are the overriding arguments here? I'd like, I'd like to argue it is this. When our enemies are at the gates, when they're besieging us and they are powerful, to what extent should we compromise? And does compromise represent taking responsibility to save the nation? Or is negotiating with Rome as Yochanan ben Zakai does, treasonous. Is fighting against the odds, either against the Romans in 70 CE or fighting against the Romans in 132 CE, is fighting against the odds to protect our independence or to regain our independence, as for the Zealots, as for Bar Kokhba, and as for Rabbi Akiva, is that heroic and courageous or is that disastrous and irresponsible? What are Kahan and Rotman arguing about? They're arguing about the lessons from the Gemara. So what are the lessons from the Gemara? Is it about the danger of zealotry, burning the storehouses? Or is it about the importance of principles of holding strong to what you believe in? To save the nation, does one need to stand firm or does one need to be prepared to change? When should we do one? When should we do the other? Now to bring it into super contemporary, super politicized, and I genuinely am not, not passing judgment here, but is Bennett joining a government with merits? Is that an example of national responsibility? 
or is it treachery? You'll notice I, I didn't mention joining a government with Ram because anyone who follows the news would know that Netanyahu was also very happily joined a government with Ram, but he wouldn't have joined with Meretz. So that's the question. Is joining, is, is a national religious right winger who joins with Meretz, is that a sign of national responsibility or is it treachery? Is refusing to sit with Netanyahu, is that a sign of baseless hatred? Is that a boycott? Or is it the result of his personality and his politics? This is what the debate is about now. It's also partially what it's about then. And I think what's interesting is that you can make a whole list of people who are to blame. I think there's just been one comment, someone who said they're all to blame, and, and that's right. But um, there's, there's one there's one other comment. There's one other comment which was directed to me that I'll read out, um, which is from Carl, who says that the, the rabbinim of the time seemed to lack the authority to effectively direct the people and to navigate the difficult times. It's a lack of leadership. The rank and file will always be hot headed. It's the leaders who need to lead. They were too passive. Right. So, yeah, listen, I think that's an excellent point. And it actually relates actually relates to at least two things. Firstly, we know that the sages, again, we know because the Gemara tells us, the sages were at the feast and they did nothing. So right from the beginning, had they, well, right from the beginning, the servant should have just delivered the correct letter. But putting that aside, um, had the rabbi stood up and prevented the humiliation, then things would have been different. But had Zachary ben Avkalus been willing to kind of step outside his very narrow halachic framework of what well, we're not allowed, you know, the halacha says you're not allowed to offer sacrifice a, uh, um, a lamb or whatever that's got a cut above the eye, then also it may not have happened. Once we pass then, it does seem that the, the sages are, are interested in compromise, but, but as is mentioned, they, 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 they don't control the people, it's, it's suddenly, it's the, uh, I, I don't want to say lunatics in, in, um, in charge of the asylum, but it is, it is the thugs who take over. Um, so yes, abs absolutely, absolutely. Um, so we, you know, we could, we could really get, we could go through, we could go through, it's the host's fault, it's Barcumsa's fault, it's um, the thug's fault, it's a whole bunch of people. Interestingly, and I think this speaks very well of Jewish tradition, it's not the Romans' fault. Nowhere in the story are the Romans blamed for <laughs> defeating us because traditionally, Jewish tradition looked inwards, because of our sins. We can complain mm -hmm. to God, but we don't complain that the Ro we don't complain to the Romans. Um, mm -hmm. Now, there's, there's one other person who um, could potentially be blamed um, and actually is partially blamed even in the story, and that's Yochran ben Zakai. Why, why is Yochran ben Zakai blamed? Because he should, the argument goes, certainly what Rabbi Akiva says, he should have asked for Jerusalem. He chickened out. Firstly, he wanted to compromise with Romans, but then even when he was there, he, he, he chickened out. Um, and what's interesting here, and I'm kind of now moving, moving slightly on, is that Yochan ben Zakkai generally, and this is a generalization, but generally is considered to be, in a positive way, the father of diaspora Judaism. I mean, there, there's a diaspora already for, for a good 500, 600 years by, by this time. But the, the adaption away from a temple-oriented Judaism people give credit to Yochanan ben Zakkai for that. But one of the main components of early Zionism is disdain for the diaspora, for the exile. Why? Because exile, the thinking went, exile made us weak. Exile humiliated us. Exile led to, this is, even be, this is like 50 years before the Holocaust, exile led to death and destruction, and it led to us not being able to, to um, fulfill 
our Jewishness. We became like subhumans in the diaspora. And what we need to do, the thinking went, was to create this new type of Hebrew, a Hebrew who would not be humiliated, a Hebrew who would be strong, who would be heroic, who would be mighty, who would be courageous. For those who know ethics of the fathers, Pekavot, so the rabbis say, who is, who is strong, who is a hero? The person who controls their urges. No more. That's no, that's no longer a gibor. That's no longer a hero. You know who a hero is? A person who fights. Abba Achimeir, who was a, um, a thinker and a writer in the 1930s and was very much a part of the kind of the maximalist wing of the revisionist movement, has this great line. He says this, our Messiah will not come in the form of a poor man riding a donkey. The Messiah will come, as all Messiahs do, riding on a tank. We don't liberate, things have changed, newsflash. We don't liberate ourselves anymore from learning Torah all day. We liberate ourselves by learning how to fight, learning how to protect ourselves, learning how to not be humiliated. And in that context, who becomes the villain of this story, Yochanan ben Zakkai. And there's, there's, there's some crazy stuff by Yochanan ben Zakkai. Someone called, uh, a, a, a poet called Yonatan Ratosh calls Yochanan ben Zakkai the Jewish Petan, as in the head of the Vichy government who collaborated with the Nazis, that's Yochanan ben Zakkai, mm. or a Quisling, he calls him. And who are the heroes? according to this train of thought, the thugs, the zealots, certainly Bar Kochba, but even brings Bar Kochba, the zealots are the heroes because they stand up against the enemy. So I just want to read just a few different things. Um, Berdyshevsky is one of the main early Zionist thinkers who talks about this creation of a new Jew. Um, and he says what the Jewish people needed now was a new Yochanan ben Zakkai, one who would flee from Yavne back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem and Yavne are antagonistic. The zealots who fell upon their swords were superior to those who escaped the walls hidden in coffins. That's how ben Zakkai gets out. He needs to pretend to be dead in order to get out, to then negotiate with our enemy. Um, now, what's interesting, just uh, again, Abba Chimeir says, calls Ben a traitor. Not only did he collaborate with the enemy and contribute to the loss of the homeland, but he prepared the way for diaspora Judaism. Abba Chimeir creates a small clandestine faction of the revisionist Zionist movement. Do you know what he calls it? Brit Habil Yonim. Mm. Covenant of thugs. The covenant of zealots. He, he, the the Bir Yonim of this story become the heroes for many early Zionists. Unless you think this is just right-wingers. It is not. Yitzhak Tebenkin is one of the founders of the Kibbutz movement. He was an MK for Mapam and Akduta Avodah parties. He says, it wasn't Yochanan ben Zakkai who saved the Jewish spirit. Our national existence was preserved by the military valor of the Jewish zealots, the Biryonim, and its memory. The valor of those who fought and did not give in, who clung until the last minute to the hope of victory. Thanks to them, the name of Yochanan ben Zakkai too was kept alive, as with the Torah, the Hebrew language and culture, and the humane spirit our people has manifested. So suddenly we have this complete switch. Right, but Carla, can I just add one more name to that list? Um, so I'm, I'm prompted by Shmuel Taub, one of our audience here, who rem remarked in the chat, no more Kishinevs, in reference to the Kishinev pogrom. And many people may know or have read Chaim Bialik's famous um, In the City of Slaughter, in re the re about 
that about that pogrom in which he is absolutely scathing in the most uh, sc- the most scornful and dismissive and if an insulting way of the passivity of the Jews of of Kishinev who lay there trampled in the dirt while the Cossacks rampaged and raped their wives and took their, and took their belongings and this was and it was this is like one of the great sort of you know cri de coeur of 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 the Zionists saying no more passivity no more uh, no more uh, compromise, we fight, right? 100%. I'm glad people brought up Kishinev um, because yes, it is, it is a classic poem written by Bialik that very, very much reflects this view of what is needed and what the problem is. I would add a couple of things. Firstly, it's complete fiction. That did not happen at Kishinev. Ironically, at Kishinev, there were actually some quite strong Jews who managed to, who did manage to fight against the marauders. But again, similar ish to the Gemara, it doesn't really matter about the historical record, because what's important is how it reflects the thinking. And it absolutely reflects the thinking. And, and for those who know it better, some who, who, who might not know it, Bialik uses roaches dogs, pigs. This is what the Jews have become. And it's not just that they st- they hide while the women are getting raped, but after everyone has left, the first thing they do, according to Bialik's in brackets fictional poem, they don't go to their wives to check whether their wives are feeling okay. They go to the rabbis to ask if uh, yes, yeah, someone's written it. Shmuel, yeah, Shmuel, Shmuel obviously knows, knows it very well. They go to the rabbis to ask whether their wives are permitted because their wives have just been raped. As in, what's Bialik saying? Living in exile has turned us into animals or subhumans. What sort of man, sorry, I know this is very kind of classic, whatever, but what sort of man stands by and hides as his wife is getting uh, attacked, assaulted? And what sort of person, what sort of religious person, how warped do you need to be to first go to the rabbi because you're so interested in halakha rather than have some kind of basic human um, feeling? So yes, all of this came out. And it's that sort of tfisat olam approach that began to see the heroes of the story as the zealots. And the baddies of the story as those who collaborated with the enemy. And if the zealots are the heroes, how much more so is Bar Kokhba a hero? So I want to just share just a couple of, uh, a couple of things, one of which is, a, I, I only realized how famous the song was when my four-year-old daughter came back from Gun with a story about Bar Kokhba, and it was based on this, this song. There's a song about Bar Kokhba um, that was written by, um, was written by uh, someone called Kipnis in, in 1930. Just one second. And uh, it's very nice. It's, you, you could even for a moment forget how the story of Bar Kokhba ends. Um, so this, some of this we've done already. Um, so this is the source in the middle. Um, and, and even as I even as I say it, I kind of even want to hum hum the tune. It's a very very catchy tune. Uh, I will not hum it or sing it. There was a man in Israel whose name was Bar Kochba, a man young and tall with eyes that shined. He was brave. He called for liberty. The people loved him because he was brave. Sounds great. I would love to meet this man. He sounds like a complete hero. Um, But it's not just a nice little song. The school children learn. Bar Kokhba as a hero is deeply, deeply embedded, certainly in early Zionist, but I'd say even uh, current Zionist thinking. Again, this is not a right wing or left wing thing. Max Nordau um, gave a whole speech. It's called Jury of Muscle. 
Again, think back to Kishinev, think back to the pogroms, think back to this idea of we need to create a new Jew who is a hero, the person. It's all about creating a strong Jew who will no longer, who will fight back and will not be humiliated. Now we need to find models for that in our history. Barkovka is an obvious one. This is what Nordau says. The desire of going back to a glorious past finds a strong expression in the name which the Jewish Gymnastic Club in Berlin has chosen for itself. Bar Kochba was a hero who refused to know defeat. When in the end victory eluded him, he knew how to die. Bar Kochba was the last embodiment in world history of a bellicose military jury. To evoke the name of Bar Kochba is an unmistakable sign of ambition. But ambition is well suited for gymnasts striving for perfection. So again, suddenly we, 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 we've been going on a journey here. We begin with who are the heroes, who are the villains? And Yochan ben Sakai is he's criticized in the story, but I personally would say that if I'm going through my, my top three responsible for the destruction of the temple, ben Sakai doesn't make it in. Um, and then suddenly, it, when we're looking for muscular Jews, that changes a bit. He's the Patan, he's a Quisling, and suddenly the Zealots are the heroes. And now Bakochba is the hero. Um, and Bakochba is a hero in Zionist thought for a long, long time. I think even I remember Rabbi Benny Lau, who's, who's a, a rabbi in Jerusalem, once said that he remembers learning about Bar Kochba, but, and even in my four, again, not to base everything on, on a four-year-old uh, book coming back from Gunn, but the book's very sweet. It doesn't talk about the end. It doesn't talk about the end. Um, and, and, and I think this was, this was kind of, Bar Kochba is this great Jewish military hero. He's very courageous, he's whatever. Um, and, and, and people kind of left out the bit where Judea gets completely I was going to say decimated, but actually it's even, it's even worse than being decimated. Over half a million Jews get slaughtered. It's, it's the end. The Jews remain in the Galilee, but it's, it's the end of Jewish presence in the land. Um, now, in the early 1980s, an essay gets published. It's called The Bar Kochba Syndrome. It's written by someone called Yehoshaphat Hakarbi who was a, a teacher at uh, Hebrew University. And he was a former um, head of military intelligence in the IDF. And I'm gonna share, we don't have a huge amount of time. Um, I'm just gonna share just a couple of paragraphs because it's, it's a very, very interesting piece. And Hakabi says as follows, and as you can probably imagine, it was very controversial. And by the way, in the background, what's going on in the early eighties is the first Lebanon war. Are you doing the screen share, Caliph? I'm going to do the screen share in a moment, yeah. Okay. Um, and he basically argues that the Bar Kokhba rebellion was a disaster. The so Bar Kokhba brought disaster upon us, and by us turning him into a hero, we then encourage, in the state that we now have, military and political adventurism, because we're he's our hero but he he's not a hero he, he led us to destruction and by us worshipping him in inverted commas what we are worshipping is basically national suicide so here is just a couple of um as you can imagine i'm, I'm sure you can imagine this this was quite controversial um so this is just a couple of things that um hakabi says one second. The name Carthage denotes total ruin, yet the number killed in Judea was more than twice and perhaps three times the number of victims among uh, the Carthaginians when their city was destroyed in 146 BCE. By way of comparison, Bar Kokhba, we may recall havoc wreaked by the Mongols in their offensive treks, with the exception of the Holocaust by the Nazis, it would seem that there was never such a catastrophe like that of Bar Kokhba, one in which so many Jews were killed at once. No pogrom is commensurable 
with what the Romans perpetrated against the inhabitants of Judea. And again, what Be the fall of Beitar, that's, that's what we mark on, on Tisha B'Av. That's one, destruction. Two, we admire it. The problem is not how Bar Kochba committed a mistake, that can be explained, but rather how we've come to admire his mistake and how it influences our national thinking. By admiring the Bar Kochba rebellion, we Israelis <coughs> immerse ourselves in the predicament of reverencing our people's destruction and rejoicing at an act of national suicide. That's a very, very powerful line. Enmesh ourselves in the predicament of reverencing our people's destruction and rejoicing at an act of national suicide. A nation that reverences an act of national suicide is likely not to be balanced in shaping its policy. To admire the Bar Kokhba rebellion is to admire rebelliousness and heroism detached of responsibility for their consequences. This is the Bar Kokhba syndrome. By admiring the rebellion, that's a repeat, Jewish survival owes thanks to the Galilean Jews and the diaspora Jews who did not participate in the rebellion. This is also quite interesting. What do people say? We are the descendants of Bar Kokhba. Well, Hakabi says, you're not. There's no descendants of Bar Kokhba. They were all killed. We are the descendants of the people who did not partake in the rebellion. The key, according to Hakabi, is realism. According to my analysis, the Bar Kokhba rebellion stemmed from an unrealistic assessment of historical and political circumstances. This issue of realism is central to the formulation of all political and strategic decisions. And the prescriptions of realism apply both to individuals and to political entities. Further, since the rebellion involved considerable risk, it's necessary to analyze the issue of risk-taking and speculation and their limits. Policy always involves risk-taking with one proviso, that the national existence not be placed in ultimate jeopardy. It was precisely this proviso that was contravened by the Bar Kokhba rebellion. Now, we could talk about this for a very, very long time, and unfortunately, we don't have time. I'd say this. Hakabi doesn't say, you, you, you only do things when, when victory is guaranteed. No, that's not the case. But in the case of Bar Kokhba rebellion, he argues that the Romans were the superpower of the day, and there was no chance of winning, and losing meant total destruction. And in that case, if you as a leader rebel, it's an act of national suicide. And if we, in our return to the country, turn someone like that into a hero, then we are on very shaky ground. Now, as I said, that was very controversial. Someone called Yigal Yadin, who's the second chief of staff, writes this whole essay in response. Are we really saying that realism should be the main thing that guides us? What about values? Mm. And if that were the case, would, would Ben-Gurion even have, have, have uh, declared a state? in 1948. And the reason why that is particularly fascinating is because Yigal Yadin is in the room when the cabinet is deciding and Ben-Gurion asks him, if there's a war, what are our chances? Mm. And Yigal Yadin says, no more than 50-50. And then Ben-Gurion declares a state and we know the result. Mm. Um, so where does this leave us? What guidance can a text give about when to stand firm and when to adapt? When to be more like Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, or when to be more like Rabbi Akiva? Now, the short answer is, I don't know. I don't know. But I want to leave you with a source, which actually someone in the chat I've seen has already mentioned. I want to leave you with, 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 with this last source because I think it goes to the core of what decision making, national decision making is. When Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai fell ill, so this is, we don't know how many years later, X amount of years, five years later, 10 years later, 15 years later, his students went to greet him. As he saw them, he began to weep. They said to him, why are you crying? He responded, he responded, if they were leading me before a king of flesh and blood, who's here today and gone tomorrow, whose anger and punishments are only fleeting, 
who I could pacify with words and bribe with money, I'd cry nevertheless. But they are leading me to Melech Malchem Mal Lachim, to the King of Kings, who's eternal, as are his punishments, and who I cannot pacify with words and bribe with money. This is not all. Listen to this. There are, this is one of the greatest sages of Israel at the time. There's two paths before me, one of Gan Eden and one of Gehenna, one of heaven, one of hell. And I don't know which one they will lead me down. Should I not cry? The greatest sage of Israel doesn't know if he's going to heaven or hell. Why? Because he made a decision and he was critical. And he was critical, and he knew at the time that there was deep uncertainty, and he and afterwards that uncertainty didn't didn't clear up. He doesn't know if he's right, but he made it anyway, and that I think is is a lesson of leadership. I actually also happen to think it's it's linked to the beginning of the beginning of the Gemara that happy is the person who's always frightened, but he who hardens his heart falls into misfortune. But you've got to know before you make a national decision, you've got to know that you might be wrong, but you've got to decide. Even years later, you still might not even know whether it's correct or not, but you still have to make the decision. And I will finish with this. The Bar Kokhba rebellion, amongst other things, leads the rabbis to rejecting rebellion altogether. It's a type of post-trauma. There's even an argument that it leads to, to these promises in the Gemara that we will never rebel against the nations. 1800 or so years later, after expulsion, after pogrom, after murder, after humiliation, Early Zionism has had enough of that. And it creates a movement that promotes courage and heroism, but in some ways, it puts the act of rebellion as the ultimate value. The heroes of the story are the zealots, even though they burnt the storehouses, but they're the heroes. Now we have a reconstituted state of Israel. What I think we are, searching for is a balance between those two things. To know that sometimes we have to fight and sometimes we maybe even have to fight against the odds, but to be aware that we can't just say to the hell with realism, doesn't matter what, what, what the real relationship of forces is. We need to be realistic about things. We can't just rebel or fight whenever we want. That also leads to disaster. And I think that what Tisha B'Av comes to do is to remind us of what happens if we're wrong. What the, what the, what the, what, what, what the chances are, um, what the stakes are if we make the wrong decisions. And that's still getting debated today. And, and unfortunately the text doesn't give us a clear answer. It just gives us values to think about, but, but, but please God, we should be guided by these texts to make responsible, courageous and heroic decisions um, that lead us to continued survival and success rather than to disaster and destruction. So those outside of Israel, I wish you a, a continued meaningful fast. And um, thank you very much, Paul, for, for inviting me and I hope People found it meaningful, and um, please feel free to, to, to be in touch. Shakar, thank you very much, Carl. That was wonderful. Uh, I hope everyone uh, was uh, uh, not only informed and educated, but inspired by that. That was a great talk. Um, and food for thought for the, for the year ahead, and for those of us living in Israel uh, in particular, thinking about how our leaders manage things or sometimes don't manage things. Um, I was uh, one thing that came to mind for me was you made the reference to Ben Gurion, and and it seems to me that the the great leaders uh, or the best leaders are the ones who uh, perhaps are the ones who successfully combine that who who successfully make that strike that balance between values and um, keep keeping tr keeping true to themselves whilst also um, 
having a realistic perspective and a, and a, and a pragmatism. And I think you could, you could make that case for Ben Gurion for sure. Um, also, and I'm not just saying this because I'm speaking from the Begin Heritage Center, but Menachem Begin, um, there was a book, uh, a very good book written about the Camp David peace talks uh, between Egypt and Israel uh, by Gerald Steinberg and Ziv Rabinovitz, which came out a couple of years ago. Uh, which basically makes the case that the great the great um, contribution that Begin made to those peace talks was exactly that contribution that he had these very firm red lines where he wouldn't move, where he was completely unshakable, where he was convinced that Israel couldn't couldn't afford to make to, to move on these issues, but on other things he was willing to be pragmatic, much more pragmatic than many other people on his own side, and many other people on his own side voted against the. Uh, the, the the treaty etc and that is that combination of pragmatism and realism uh, sorry pragmatism and and and, and values um, which which made him a great leader and I think also Ben Gurion and and others um, thank you um, so I want to thank Caleb Bendor I want to thank everyone uh, for those of you who are new to this and are not on my mailing list and would like to be on my mailing list uh, you should email me Paul G at Begin Center dot all dot al i'm writing it in the chat and uh you can join my mailing list and receive a weekly email from me in which i let you know what's happening at the Bagan center in english um on zoom and actually we're starting to do some stuff now in person as well um you can also uh kind of can they contact you in some way if they want to be if they want to know what you're up to yes absolutely i'll just put my uh, email address in the chat as well it's kind of the I'll put it in the chat. Um, okay, wait, Caleb, it hasn't come up. Ah, correct, one second. Um, while Caleb's doing that, I'll just mention that we actually do have an event here at the Bagan Center next Sunday, the launch of a new book by journalist Seth Fransman uh, about drone, about the, the uh, advent of drones uh, and what they mean for security in the Middle East and, and um, for Israel. Um, information about that is on our website and our Facebook page, and I will send out details of that to those on my mailing list. We're also going to stream that live on Zoom. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, for those still fasting, uh, I hope you have an easy fast, rest of the fast. Uh, for those of you like me and Kalev who are over it, um, I'm going to have myself something to eat now. Um, and... Um, <laughs> I wish everyone a, a Shavuot of